Luis Finati, who's going to be talking about computation with vectors. I think um, I'd like to thank Nathan and the organizers for the opportunity to talk to you nice, have me nice, and the weather is great. And, and it's been nice to talk to uh, Christopher Davis about the implementation of these vectors in and um, I'm happy to at least try to contribute a little bit with SAIL, which I think is a great project. Although I have to say I'm a bit um, ashamed of my cold after we was talked yesterday. It's much worse than the little bit that we showed. But, but hopefully it's going to be useful somehow. Maybe somebody can improve it. All right. So um, I, I will talk a little bit about big vectors if you're not familiar with them, but in a very um, biased way. So with views of the, the computations that I want to do later on and based uh, on on dialects, which is the topic of this conference. So, suppose we start with uh, a chaotic number. Of course, the your traditional way to represent this is a power series. So, we make some choice of representatives for the reduction module P. And, um, and of course, if you make this choice of representatives, you might as well Think of these um, in correspondence, my, the way you might even store it, if you want, as the reductions of the coefficients. Well, you know that. So we can make these uh, identification. Uh, but the question then comes, if you want to do arithmetic with these chaotic number, how does it translate to the coordinates of this vector that keeps track of the coefficients. So um, it's, it's a fact that it's quite surprising to me uh, that if you make a nice choice of representatives in here, these, uh, the coordinates of the sum of two chaotics becomes uh, is given by polynomial formulas. So for ZP, a good choice, and the choice that makes this all work, is to take the p minus 1 roots of unity plus 0. So the nice thing about this set is that it's completely closed. So at least whenever you multiply representatives, you get another representative then immediately. So then things, uh, so then if you have a plus b, what you get in here uh, is a The coordinates are then given by polynomials in the coordinates. So here's the and the s. And the same thing if you multiply, you also get some polynomials, which I'm going to use p's for them. And so on. So but it's of course depending on your choice of representatives. Now if you go instead and uh, go over a ramified extension of ZP. You can try to copy the same idea. Uh, there's one little bit of trouble in there, is these S's and P's might not become exactly polynomials anymore. You might have some p roots showing up. But you can fix that by, instead of identifying with the straight reduction module P in here, you have to raise some powers, and that avoids having to deal with S and P's, which are not exactly polynomials. So in this situation, so the SI's and PI's are integral. And the choice of here representatives in this case is just Q minus 1 roots of 1 and 0. Now, this construction can be generalized. So, uh, of course, the residue field in here is FQ, and you might as well use the same way to define sums and products of vectors over different rings. So, this actually works not even for just characteristic P. If you define with some proper choice of polynomials S's and P's, you can define a ring structure to, uh, to infinite vectors of some arbitrary ring community of ring at least. And, uh, but I'm not going to be too concerned about 
um, these, vect or these vectors over rings which are not of characteristic P. So for me, I can even think about these as uh, these polynomials over FP. We don't have to think about them as integral, so I'm going to look at them over FP. Now, the problem is if you are going to see uh, your p addicts or q addicts in that way, you need to <coughs> compute these s's and p's to do the arithmetic. And the truth of the matter is that this is the, probably the worst possible way you can do arithmetic with p addicts. These polynomials get very large, very fast, and so it is not a proper way to actually deal with the q addicts. So, if, you know, in what I'm trying to implement, if you try to construct b vectors over a finite, uh, finite field, I'll probably just go to the q addicts, do all the arithmetic in there, and just represent the q addicts in terms of a big vector. It's probably the best thing that you can do. But there are cases where you just uh, don't have this canonical isomorphism, and you have to sort of explicitly compute these s's and p's. Okay, so, so let's say a few things about what are these and how do you compute them, things like that. So, again, this is not a proper construction of big vectors, but so one way, to, uh, the way that you can get these s and p's is um, using these polynomials. So, so this is just so we have this big polynomial given this way, and then we have the following theorem. So if you let f be a polynomial in two variables. And of course, you can generalize for more than two variables. But, uh, so polynomial two variables with integral coefficients, then there exists uh, a unique sequence, let me call it, I guess, f sub i, with uh, the elements of the sequence also integral polynomials such that if you look at f evaluated in, no, maybe I should specify here, so wn of the x's and wn of the y's, what you get is wn of this sequence of polynomials in there. So this, um, this uh, theorem is simple. So this is uh, with brackets the end here, or am I confused? So the polynomial? The so, ah, sorry, sorry. This is, so the fi's are in. Yeah. Yeah, you never define W super N. You define W okay. super ah, parentheses. Sorry, sorry. yes. <laughs> yes, all the dots. There's another one. Look. Yeah, another one. Yes. Thanks. Does that make sense? Yeah, then the F is actually destined to be a, a polynomial. Oh. Yeah, okay. So, this, uh, what I was saying is that this is a simple theorem if you. Uh, except for the fact that the, the coefficients are integral. If you look at this formula in here, you can just start solving for these. And what's going to happen, you're going to have just a division by some power of p. So you can uh, start solving, start with 0, well, what's going to be f? 0 is going to be just f. And then uh, for f1, well, we go to the formula and solve for it. 
you're going to have an x, p times x1, you can solve for, sorry, p times f1, you can solve for f1. But considerably, you're dividing by p, so the, the coefficients are not going to be integral anymore. But this gives you a, rec uh, a recurrence which allows you to compute fn in terms of the previous ones. And if you actually compute it, you get the coefficients for the integrals. And these polynomials that give you the sum and the product are just, if you take f to be x plus y, your uh, fi is what I called si before. And if you take f to be the product, then the fi is the pi is in there. Okay. So just a silly example, but that sort of has a, a little bit of an idea that I had to try to compute these or to compute with bit vectors is, of course, if you look at S0 is just the sum of the two variables. If you look at S1, you're going to have these, and then you're going to have plus x0 to the p, y0 to the p minus. Uh, here is, well, let me write explicitly. And these, of course, is just and here you have your division by p. But of course, it's clear what this is. This is just the sum, or minus the sum, I guess, from i from 1 to p minus 1, of 1 over p, p choose i, and this, of course, is an integer, x0 to the i, y0 to p minus i. So, I guess uh, it's, this is the simplest possible case. I mean, the second part of the bit factors is very easy to deal with. I mean, it's not a problem at all. But uh, this is a sort of idea I try to generalize. Because you don't have to actually store these polynomial to evaluate the second variable. You can make just a routine that does these. You make a loop or that does multiply by the corresponding binomial coefficients and does the powers and everything. So the idea is to try to avoid using, for instance, computing these S's, which take a long time in the piece, and just implementing them as subroutines. So you save a lot of memory, and you can compute things on the fly. Now, so the problem, so let me give you just a quick example, or two, I guess. So S2 for P equals to 31. So S2 gives you the third coordinate of the sum of two vectors. I mean, these vectors, uh, we're going to call them big vectors. So these are the big vectors, right? So if you start with an arbitrary ring and do these vectors and add and multiply this way, we call them big vectors over that ring. So big vectors over finite fields are q addicts, or isomorphic to q addicts. So the formula that gives you the third coordinate for p equals 31 has 152,994 monomials. And for p equals 11, uh, as for, and uh, the computations that I'm going to mention here were done in magma. I had some legacy code in magma that I didn't have the time to convert to Sage at the time I was working on these. So these computations are mostly in magma. And magma is not exactly famous to be very efficient with memory. In all tests that I've done in, in Sage, <laughs> Sage had much more, uh, was much better with respect to memory. But in any case, S4 um, took over 24 gigabytes of memory. <laughs> <laughs> So, and this is doing the usual recursion here. And of course, the recursion is then not exactly over Z, because you're doing S4, you can work over Z module P to the fourth, because you're only dividing by P to the third. Or P to the fifth, you're divided by P to the fourth. Okay, so still, uh, I was not able to do this. 
So the bottom line, of course, is that you want to try to avoid at all costs computing with weak vectors by storing these polynomials and evaluating them. Okay? So which is what you can do if you do a routine like this. Also, one might say another way to do this is to actually start lifting the coordinates. So if your coordinates are in somewhere where you can divide by p, so if you lead to something uh, modulo p squared, for instance, you don't have to expand this polynomial because you can get the result of your sum of the first two and just plug the result in here, raise to the p power, and divide by p without a problem. So that's another possibility, is to start lifting these this, uh, entries of your vectors somewhere else. So then we have the three things that we can try at least. One, if we have an isomorphism, we use the isomorphism. If we, uh, sometimes we can lift the coordinates, or we can try to actually just implement routines that are sort of going to do these without storing the, the polynomials themselves. Now, the business of lifting, of course, you have to have some canonical way or some natural way to lift this somewhere. Uh, but in some cases, it is faster than what I was doing with these routines. In some other cases, we're not. I'm still trying to figure out where is the, where it's worth going from one or, or the other. Uh, in particular, I know that if you have many variables, the routines are easier, are faster than lifting the coordinates. But it's something that we sort of have to figure out. What, so, do, you mean, what do you mean routines? So it's, it's not to store these polynomials, but have a, so here you can write something like this. So let's say this goes, <coughs> so you have your four variables in there. You just say, um, I guess result is x1 plus i1. And then you do a for loop uh, i in range 1 to p, you do add to result uh, this term, right? 1 over p, p choose i, x 0 to the i, y 0 to p minus y, and then you return hmm, the result. So you don't start the polynomial itself, you figure out what it does, and uh, you just have a routine that does the job. Okay, so the next thing I need to talk about that is something that was of interest to me, and I'll give you a little bit of my motivation for this a little later on, but it's also something that can at times be helpful with straight computation with these vectors, is the Greenberg transform. So, um, well, let me just fix some notation here. I'm going to write, well, little k is going to be just, let's assume perfect field of characteristic p, the same p that we're using in the construction of these big factors. And let me just note by r to be these infinite vectors over k with addition and sum over, ah, addition and sum given by this polynomial, so this is the ring of factors. So suppose you have a, a polynomial in two variables with coefficients in the big vectors, and you have a pair of big vectors. And, well, it seems a silly question, but how to compute f of AB. I mean, of course, it seems very silly. It's a polynomial. Uh, you do products and sums. So if you store the polynomials, you can just start evaluating them and get the products and the sums. Or, or however you do it, the products and sums, you have a routine that does the sum, and you can use it. Or, but something else that you can do is sort of use these straight. Now, this can be generalized a little bit. This, I'm assuming the coefficients here are integers. Mm. But even if you have a polynomial with uh, coefficients in, in the ring of its vectors, 
you can get polynomials. And these polynomials are going to give you the coordinates of the evaluation of this polynomial f at a pair of vectors. So what we can do is, well, not do the sum products, but evaluate these coordinates of, that you get with this theorem. So, and I'm going to say just here, evaluate the Greenberg transform. So the Greenberg transform, what you can think about it, so take, it's basically these, but if you take up your polynomial and look at a pair of variables as bit vectors of variables. Then you can, well, you're replacing the variables for your bit vectors and then you can do the products and the sums and what you get is exactly what you would get in there. So these coordinates in here, the same way that the S's and the P's gives you the coordinates for sums and products, the F's, the F's gives you the coordinates of the evaluation of the vector in some point on. So at times, uh, this is actually faster, even if you have some optimized sums and products, uh, sometimes you can actually evaluate a polynomial in two variables this way faster than doing the sums and the products. This is not much faster though. If you have already optimized your problems and sums, you gain a little bit, but it's not sign significant. But uh, these things are so complicated in any, I guess, every little bit counts. So, so these, uh, these big vector of polynomials in here is what I call the Greenberg transform of the polynomial F. In general, you hear more often people talking about the Greenberg transforms of, of varieties. So if you have a variety over ring of each vectors, well, you can think about it given as zeros of some polynomial. And the Greenberg transform of that variety is the infinite dimensional. Uh, here I truncated at n, but of course you can continue. So the Greenberg transform in principle is something that is infinite dimensional given by the zeros of the coordinates of the Greenberg transform of the polynomial. So in particular, it's in characteristic p, why the region is in characteristic zero. But of course, in here also, you truncate to get approximations and get something that is finite dimension. And you have a natural bijection between the rational points. OK, but so what was my motivation to actually start trying to compute with, with bit vectors? And actually, I had to deal with the green pair transform, which if these polynomials S's and P's are complicated. You can imagine if you take a complicated polynomial, what's going to happen with them. So, so a little bit of motivation. I'm trying to be very brief here because it's not quite relevant to the computation. But what I wanted to do was the following. So suppose you have your field characteristic pk, and let's look at uh, ordinary values of k, by which I mean just uh, values in k whose j variance, you know, j variance in k that give you um, ordinary elliptic curves. So if you take, uh, well, let's say, you can, you can, I want to get a map from here to the ring of these vectors. That is, that is the following. So since here you have an ordinary elliptic curve, you can associate to that the canonical lifting of that elliptic curve. Now, this then is a bit vector. And well, let me call this g0. Maybe. And the coordinates of these, of course, are functions on, let me get at another one. Functions on your G0 there, of course. So you give me an ordinary elliptic curve, I give you the current validity. And Mazur and Tate asked about what can we say about these coordinate functions? So um, I studied that. I tried to give some answers to that question. And one thing that you have to do 
we have to compute the, if you want to compute examples of these, you have to compute the Greenberg transform of the classical modular polynomial. So if you can do that, there's some evaluations that you have to do, but then you can get the formulas for these. And I wanted to get some formulas to get even a conjecture on what these would be or would look like with what kind of properties they had. So the thing is, for p equals to 7, to compute J3, so it was the fourth formula of the green pair transform of the modular polynomial, took again, I guess, I, I'm saying 24, it took, oh, it took over 24 gigs, because it crashed before <laughs> I, it finished. Um, and so I could only get J3 for p equals to 5. So I couldn't get any information. So then after I worked this out, and it's, uh, so what I could, so with new methods, this was done with computing these Greenberg transform by doing products and sums. So with new methods, I could compute the same thing with 40 megabytes in 7.3 seconds. Now, I think there's something very fishy of what happened there with magma. This is maybe too much. <laughs> but, but in any case... I think magma just can't control memory. Yeah, I can make it casual. Not, not, not yeah, it, and the, the thing is, of course, um, this polynomial, even the answer, even with the 40 megabytes, it, it's huge. Okay, so if it doesn't let go of things, it, it really is going to explode very quickly. Even so, I mean, magma's inefficiency in memory maybe could account for one order of magnitude, but right. you have three. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I, there's some content there. Yeah, yeah, hope so. <laughs> All right, so um, so let me say a, a few words about the the what it looks like, and, and this motivates what is going to come next. So if you want to look at the F1, so you have some polynomial F, um, again, polynomial two variables over the ring of these vectors. And if you want to look at the green barrier transform, if you want to look at the first coordinate, uh, I need to sort of specify this a little bit more. Let's say that the coefficients are Aij, the coefficients are bit vectors, and let's say then that aij is just aij0, aij1, and so on. So what happens? So it's very easy to sort of get the, the second coordinate, as usual. So here it comes f0, which is the first coordinate, which is just the reduction modulo p. So then you take a partial derivative with respect to uh, the first variable in here, so let me call x0, raise the p, multiply by x1. Something similar would happen with a partial risk with the y coordinate, so to speak. Then in here, you have sort of the shift of, of this polynomial here. So you're going to have the sum of the coefficients are going to be turned to the second coordinate, but because of the way that you know shift from piadic sums to, to bit vectors, there are going to be some p powers showing up. And this is all easy to compute. Of course, uh, everything is easy in the first coordinate. But uh, the harder part comes next in here. So there are a couple of ways you can sort of say what comes in here. One way is, um, is a bit cumbersome, but is the point. So I haven't introduced this notation yet, but uh, bear with me for a second. And actually, I have to put a little error in here. So I can leave. I have. I might have one way to do it is to leave this module p squared, so I can then divide by p. So in here, I'm going to have to go back to characteristic p, so I have to uh, reduce module p. So what is this in here? 
So basically, uh, to lift to characteristic P, or you can might as well, or you can say uh, lifting F0, you might as well take F, well, it doesn't have to be F itself. But basically, you, uh, what you do is just take P power of every single monomial that shows up, or every single term that shows up in there. Okay, so if you have F is sum of Dij, Xij, sorry, Y, to the J, then this bracket P in there is just going to be the sum of Bij to the P, X, Pi, Y, Pj. Now, this is uh, one way to see what's happening on the on the second corner. And this is not that bad, but I guess I should just. But what I really want is I, I don't want to have to lift. I want to do things in characteristic p. Okay. So what I want to do is replace these by something else, which I'm going to call eta one, which is what which is what I want to divide define next of back of f0. So back of f0 is just a vector that has uh, the coefficients, uh, sorry, the monomials of your polynomial. So to have your polynomial, you just collect the, the terms and make a vector out of it. So the advantage is that you don't have to lift and you have some function that is going to do the job of, is going to avoid you lifting these. And I'm going to define these functions. And this, uh, this is only eta 1, and they're going to be a bunch of different etas. And this is what's going to do the job. So this is the function that basically is going to, these are the functions that are going to be, take care of the divisions module p that you have. And they're going to be defined in terms of entries which are in characteristic p directly. There's no, lift, there's no lifting anymore. So, anything before? So what are the, so what is eta 1? Well, eta 1 you can sort of expect of what it is. So you have a vector with our entries. Well, it has to do the job that you have it here. So basically, this is going to be x0 to the p. Ah, let me start in 1. Ah, x1 to the p, xr to the p, minus the sum, x1 through xr to the p divided by p. Now, again, this, this is easy to see that it has integral coefficients. And it's going to do exactly this job in here. So just translate the problem into uh, computing these functions in here, which again, there's this problem of getting uh, the coefficients or getting the reduction module p of them, because that's all that matters for us, because we're working in characteristics. So the definition of the n case, of, sorry, at the case, is like that. So we have eta 0 of x1 through xr is just the sum. And for k greater than or equal to 1, what you get is, again, a recursive formula, so eta sorry, w to the k of eta 0 through eta k is equal to the, p to the k powers of the variables added. So again, you have a recursive formula for which you can solve for the x. Now, uh, also, eta k of only one variable for k greater than or equal to 1 is just zero, which is helpful. So this eta 1 exactly is what's coming from this definition here. It takes care of uh, the Greenberg transform, the second coordinate of the Greenberg transform at least. You do everything characteristic p if you can get this point. So the problem then is shifted from computing the s's and the piece to computing the eta's. And part of the, beaut the beauty of it is that you don't have to store the s's and the p's anymore. All that you have to store are the eta's. And it does the job for both. 
It does a job for the Greenberg transform of any polynomial, in particular of x plus y and x times y. Now, one thing that you might complain is, uh, and it's very fair, is that we have different etas in here for different numbers of variables. So we didn't, we're not exactly sure how many do we need. But the point is that if you know how to compute the eta in two variables, you can sort of get the eta in any number of variables by reducing. So a quick example would be the following. Suppose you have, you want to compute eta one of x1 through xr, y1 to yS. So let me call these, these first entries in here v1, the second entries here v2. So we can split these in eta1 of v1 plus eta1 of v2 plus eta1 of the sum of the x's comma sum of the s's. So notice that in here, I have only two entries. And in here, I have less entries. So I can make a recursion that if you have many variables, it reduces until you get to the point where you have two entries. Now, it's highly recursive. It gets much worse whenever you go from one to higher case. But so this gives you this option of, instead of computing the s's and the p's, you compute the etas only in two variables, and you store them, and use to compute the etas that show up elsewhere. So, the, uh, and then, so we are left with the matters of either storing or computing these etas in two variables somehow. Uh, there's another way that I, I used in there, where you don't store these etas and you compute them in the fly. So that's sort of uh, what I was talking about earlier in here, having a routine. So there's a routine that computes these etas in two variables without having to actually store them. Now, this routine, though, is not quite, uh, quite nice. Uh, but I'll, before I, I give you some data on the differences of the two methods, maybe I should give an idea of how bad it is for higher case. Okay, so here is the... Yeah. So here's a proposition that does these sort of breaking pieces to compute the etas from many variables using only the etas in two variables. So the idea is in the end, so let me put down here, eta i of x1 to xr is going to be the sum of some vector which I'm calling script m. So you're going to add some, the terms in some vector and you're going to get these. So what I need now is to define what are the entries of this vector. So it starts simple enough. Uh, let me sort of use the same notation here. Let me call this sum in here S1 and this sum in here S2. So the size of this vector mi depends on i. So for i equals to 1, you have only these three terms. So, but in general, these three terms always show up. So we have uh, eta i of v1. You have another entry that is eta i of v2. And you have a third entry that is eta i of the sum. So here is where you get away with only two coordinates. But after one, we want to have to introduce new terms. So, so for i greater than 1, basically what you do 
you, you have, and let's say, J, you're going to introduce another I minus 1 entries to your vector. So what you're going to do in I 3 plus J, so introduce another I minus 1 entries, is going to be, <laughs> it's going to be eta J of the M I minus J. So this M I minus J is just a vector with all these entries in here, right? So M I minus J is M I minus J <coughs> 1 all the way through. The last one is M I minus J, I minus J plus 2. So maybe it's clear, it's messy, and as you can see, it's highly recursive. Because, uh, well, let me show you a quick example, and you probably can get a better idea of what's really happening here. <clears throat> so, as I said before, M1, whose the sum is eta1, is just eta1 of 1 eta1 of 2, eta1 of s1, comma, x2. Now, when you go to the next one, you're going to have these with indices 2, and one extra factor, which is eta1 of the previous one. So you see, even if you can uh, you have only four factors. If you have only four factors in here, you're done, right? Because here you're going to have only two terms. Here you're going to have only two terms, and you know how to compute that, and here you have only two terms. But when you go to the next, you can compute these. You're going to have only two terms, only two terms, only two terms. But you have to compute the eight of something with three terms. And you have to do the recursion again. For M3, you're going to have indices 3 here, of course. Then you're going to have eta 2 of m1. And you're going to introduce eta 1 of m2. So this whole mass in here comes as the entry of another eta. And this is basically the pattern. So it keeps adding eta's of the previous to the end. Now, let me give you the, I'm a bit worried about time, I don't want to go over. So, let me just say it here. We can compute eta i in two variables. Let me just say on the fly here. So without storing anything, well, you have to store some, it helps if you store some binomial coefficients but they're much quicker to compute than uh, anything that we have done before. So it basically introduces a routine that computes eta's in two variables. So there are some differences in there, and I'm going to give times on, so let's say in bit vectors of length 6 over the field with 10 to the 11 elements. Now, of course, uh, I'm doing the computations using these methods, and this is not how you should do computations in this ring. You should actually go to Q addicts or 11 addicts, or 11 to the 10 addicts. But this is just to give you an idea of the differences between the methods, because if you start plugging things in here which are complicated, this is going to take way too long to factually uh, <laughs> complete. But to add, uh, Two, these are uh, average times to add two vectors. So there are two ways. So storing eta i's of x comma y. And by the way, let me just observe that, remember we could not, this is within the S5, which we're doing using the polynomials. We cannot even compute S4. 24 gigs is not enough. 
So these are using different methods, these methods that I'm talking about. So if you're, if you're just going to store these polynomials and use them to compute uh, these pieces in here, mm. then takes uh, 3.61 hours to get the ATAS. But then, one second to act. So you spend a lot of time getting these, but then takes only one second to act. The other alternative is to compute on the fly, so you don't store anything except some binomial coefficients. And then it takes uh, 5.75 seconds to get uh, just say, some coefficients in there that are necessary. But as you can see, this it doesn't compare, but it takes 26 seconds to add. So it gets worse to add because it's way too recursive. And um, I was happy to see that cache function because uh, the way I implemented it, it does recompute many things over and over. Although I think in in the end, compared to what it has to recompute, is relatively quick. I don't know if it's going to be much make much of a difference, but it might help somewhat. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go into details of how you compute these these on the fly because I'm running out of time. Um, but it's something that is actually quite similar to these. You're going to have some standard thing that comes in the first set of coordinates, which is kind of messy. And then uh, the next coordinates are going to all add ADAs of the previous ones. And in this case, you're, is, a, is a routine to compute ADA in two variables, but it's going to call ADAs in more variables, which are going to call the routine to, call to compute two variables again. So it is a huge mess. On the other hand, it does seem to give uh, improvements in, with respect to other methods. So the last thing that I wanted to say, oh, I shouldn't have it written that. But uh, the last thing I wanted to sort of show you was the formula for the green barrier transform. Now, this formula. Um, is based again, it's, again, is something very similar to this. They all follow the same principle. You're going to have some standard uh, vector that comes in the first piece. And then you're going to start adding ADAs of the previous vectors, just like we've done in this example in here. But, um, but let me give you, before I, or maybe I shouldn't spend too much time in giving you the formula. The formula of giving Bragg transform is not only nice in terms of computations. Um, but it also uh, what I, was my main tool to actually get the results on these canonical liftings of the J invariants. So it's also useful in theoretical applications. But as an example, if you compute the green barrier transfer of x plus y, which is going to give you basically, basically the, the s's, right? But if you have a formula for it, what we get is the following. Uh, so again, I'm going to follow the same approach that we have here. Sn is going to be the sum of the entries of some vector, which I'm going to call script Sn. So I mean, let me keep the same notation so I don't get even more confused. 